This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United States is continuing to ratchet up pressure on the Venezuelan government in an attempt to topple President Nicolas Maduro. On Tuesday, the State Department announced it's giving control of Venezuela's U.S. bank accounts to opposition leader Juan Guaido, who declared himself president of Venezuela last week. This came a day after the U.S. imposed a de facto embargo on oil from Venezuela's state-run oil company, PDVSA. The new sanctions include exemptions for several U.S. firms, including Chevron and Halliburton, to allow them to continue working in Venezuela. Meanwhile, the U.S. has also refused to rule out a military invasion of Venezuela. On Monday, National Security Advisor John Bolton was photographed holding a notepad on which he had written the words, 5,000 troops to Colombia. Earlier today, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro tweeted, quote, People of the U.S., I ask for your support to reject the interference of Donald Trump's government in making my homeland a Vietnam and Latin America. Don't allow it, he tweeted. President Maduro told a Russian news network Wednesday he was open to negotiating with the opposition. Major opposition protests are planned for today. On Tuesday, the Office of the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights criticized the Venezuelan government for cracking down on earlier protests. According to the U.N., at least 40 people have been killed and 850 detained since the recent round of anti-government protests began. On Tuesday, Vice President Mike Pence met with members of the Venezuelan opposition at the White House. Trump's new special envoy to Venezuela, Elliot Abrams, also took part in the meetings. Elliot Abrams is a right-wing hawk who was convicted in 1991 for lying to Congress during the Iran-Contra scandal, but he was later pardoned by President George H. W. Bush. Abrams defended Guatemalan dictator General Efraim Rios Montt as he oversaw a campaign of mass murder and torture of indigenous people in Guatemala in the 1980s. Rios Montt was later convicted of genocide. Abrams was also linked to the 2002 coup in Venezuela that attempted to topple Hugo Chavez. Well, today we spend the hour looking at the crisis in Venezuela and the appointment of Elliot Abrams as special envoy. We're joined by the award-winning investigative journalist Alan Nairn, who's closely tracked Elliot Abrams' record for over three decades. Alan Nairn is two-time winner of the George Polk Award, a recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Award for International Reporting. Alan spoke with us earlier this week from Jakarta, Indonesia. He began by talking about the significance of the appointment of Elliot Abrams. What his appointment emphasizes, re-emphasizes, it was already obvious, was that the U.S. is trying to overthrow the government uh, of, of Venezuela uh, and that it will be willing uh, to use violence, to use uh, military force uh, if necessary. Uh, that's what Abrams and indeed U.S. policy has, uh, uh, has been all about. Uh, I think their first preference would be to have a successful uh, covert operation. Uh, Mike Pompeo, when he was in charge of the CIA, uh, all but stated it uh, publicly uh, at one point when he was speaking in, uh, in Aspen at, at one of those uh, gatherings of the uh, uh, elite, uh, he, he gave the rough outlines of uh, uh, an operation in co coordination with uh, U.S. allies like uh, Colombia to topple uh, the Maduro uh, government uh, in, in Venezuela. Uh, and now, just recently, the night before uh, Guaido uh, declared himself as the new president of Venezuela, uh, he was on the phone with Mike Pence directly. Uh, Pence was, uh, the Wall Street Journal broke the story. Pence was uh, uh, directly talking to him, and the next day he comes out and declares himself as the president of Venezuela. Uh, and now they're asking, uh, they're offering incentives to uh, Venezuelan army officers to come over uh, to their side uh, and hoping that the U.S. can reestablish control of Venezuela uh, in that manner. But if that fails, um, I think there is a, a chance uh, that the U.S. would consider uh, an invasion of, of uh, Venezuela. This would not be the first or even the second or third preference of the Pentagon or the CIA or the, or the State Department, but it might be very attractive to Donald Trump for several reasons. In 2016, during the campaign, uh, speaking of Iraq, Trump said, to the victor belong the spoils. Uh, you have to go in and take uh, the oil. Uh, 
uh, you could call this a, a Trump doctrine. And Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves. Now, very often, oil is used as the explanation for the motive for U.S invasions and foreign policy, and I think its role is usually way overblown. People give it too much weight in, in the analysis. But in this case, it might turn out to be very relevant given that Trump has that doctrine and is now personally in power. Uh, secondly, uh, politically, Trump needs a new war. Uh, Trump has been uh, stuck with, for him, the, being in the embarrassing position of just uh, being able to uh, continue the old uh, W. Bush and, uh, and Obama wars. There's a consensus among U.S. Uh, mainstream historians that no president can be great unless he has a war. Uh, they, they say this uh, all the time. And Trump now, of course, is in uh, some political uh, difficulty. So for him, uh, an action where the U.S. went into Venezuela in spectacular faction, uh, did it quick in the style of the U.S. Uh, invasions of Grenada or, uh, or Panama. It didn't get bogged down, but just went in, say, for a few weeks, uh, killed without uh, restraint, which is the doctrine Trump is now applying to U.S. forces worldwide. I mean, he's basically told the CIA and the Pentagon, don't worry about uh, any constraints on civilian casualties that may have existed before, uh, do what you will. In fact, in Afghanistan, he celebrated the dropping of what was called the mother of all bombs, this, this massive uh, explosive, which is the, the closest uh, conventional explosive that you can get to a nuclear weapon. This was dropped in a mountainous region of Af Afghanistan, and uh, tr Trump was crowing about it afterwards. So a, sh a quick invasion with massive force that succeeds in toppling uh, the Maduro government, and then where the U.S. gets out uh, quickly, is the kind of thing that could, in theory, be att attractive to Trump. And it's also the kind of thing that I guarantee you would be praised to the heavens on CNN and, and on MSNBC, uh, and uh, this would be uh, a sweet political victory uh, for Trump. Now, it, uh, whether it's actually possible to pull off a quick, successful military invasion of uh, Venezuela is entirely a different question, because uh, it would face major resistance, uh, even if you know some of the army had already switched sides uh, to the uh, uh, U.S. side. There would be a lot of people who would want to resist it. But it is the case that the reality in Venezuela today is very different than it has been uh, during, the, during earlier years of the, the Bolivarian uh, movement in, uh, in Venezuela. The U.S. has always, and this is an important point for understanding the U.S. context, the U.S. doesn't care at all about elections. They don't care at all about uh, the poor. Completely fake elections are fine with them. Uh, the U.S. just, uh, you know, not long ago finished ratifying a fraudulent election in uh, Honduras where Hernandez imposed himself for re-election. Uh, and he did that with the assistance of uh, Mike Pence and, uh, and others. They don't care about the poor. Uh, they targeted Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian movement from the uh, beginning. In 2002, even though Chavez had not long before been reelected in a clean vote, a completely clean vote, for years, uh, the Carter Center and other international monitors who went to Venezuela uh, was reporting uh, that their electoral system was uh, in that era uh, they did a clean count. They were not rigged elections. Uh, despite that, despite the fact that the Chavez administration was making great strides in uh, raising living standards for the poor, uh, starting to lower the levels of malnutrition, starting to raise the levels of general health, um, or maybe because of that, uh, the U.S. in 2002 uh, Move, backed uh, a coup against Chavez that briefly removed him but was ultimately unsuccessful because the population uh, and much of the security forces rallied to Chavez's side and they thwarted uh, the U.S. effort to oust him. Today, it's a different uh, situation. Uh, uh, the U.S. has been trying to undermine the Venezuelan uh, government ever since the Chavez years, as has the uh, Venezuelan oligarchy. Uh, in fact, 
uh, not long after the, uh, the brief failed uh, coup, which was backed by the U.S., the rich of uh, Venezuela, the business owners, went on a capital strike. Uh, they purposely shut down their businesses, and it had huge impact. They succeeded in shaving something like 27% off the gross domestic product of Venezuela, which is just astonishing, uh, uh, catastrophic in a short time. But even that failed to uh, topple Chavez. But in the condition we have today where Maduro uh, does not have near the popular support that Chavez did, where he's really been running the country into the ground and has been using the fact that the U.S. is trying to undermine uh, the government uh, as a universal excuse for everything, for his own incompetence and corruption uh, and uh, brutality against protesters in the streets. Uh, uh, this government, the Maduro government, is in a rather uh, uh, weak position. And it appears that the population is now becoming rather uh, divided. Uh, for years, the opposition in Venezuela was uh, kind of a, a classical rightist Latin American uh, force with uh, the rich, the very rich, the oligarchs, uh, the business, top business people aligned with many sectors of, uh, of the middle class. But now it seems that opposition is spread and there, there are many poor people who are part of it. Um, uh, so this means uh, this Maduro government is rather weak and is vulnerable uh, to being toppled. It is possible. It's not impossible uh, as it was in previous years uh, un under uh, Chavez. But, and this is important to note, even though much of the U.S. news coverage and many of the U.S. analysts note the fact uh, that a lot of poor people are now joining and going into the streets prote protesting against Maduro, there is absolutely no way that the U.S. will allow uh, a poor people's movement. Let's say if uh, a new uh, political, if there Imagine if such a thing came into being, a poor people's movement in Venezuela that did want to oust uh, Maduro but replace it with a new uh, policy of, uh, that, that was also pro-poor and sought to uh, uh, gain justice. Uh, there's no way the U.S. would, would tolerate that. Uh, the U.S. will insist that a new opposition that comes to power be controlled by the far right uh, uh, elements who represent uh, the very rich and are who willing to take uh, instructions from Washington, as was clearly uh, illustrated in the case of Pence and the, the newly uh, proclaimed uh, president of, uh, of self-proclaimed president of, of, of Venezuela. So uh, it's a very dangerous situation right now. And I think what the proper role for the U.S. Uh, at this moment uh, is, one, to uh, lift the sanctions, lift the stranglehold uh, that is currently uh, uh, increasing the level of hunger. There's a, there's a level of misery in Venezuela that was already caused by the incompetence of this uh, government. But the U.S. has done everything it can to increase it. Just in the past few days, for example, uh, the U.S. has been moving legally uh, to block the Venezuelan government from using uh, $1.2 billion worth of gold, which it has uh, stored in uh, uh, London. Uh, and by, and, and he, they're, in doing this, they're being backed by uh, the, the opposition by uh, Guaido, uh, and this will mean less money available in Venezuela to buy basic uh, provisions, basic uh, supplies, food, uh, medicine, uh, etc. So lift first, uh, lift the stranglehold, uh, and secondly, disavow uh, the invasion uh, option, and then step back. You know some. People in the, the Democratic Party, for example, in the United States float the idea of the U.S. trying to facilitate, be the mediator in finding a political solution for Venezuela. Uh, but that's not appropriate. The, the U.S. has no standing to be uh, a, a mediator, a disinterested third party. The U.S. is on one side. They're on the side uh, of the right and the, the rich in Venezuela who are trying to topple this government. Uh, and the U.S. is trying to overthrow the government. They can't be a mediator. It's somewhat comparable to Israel-Palestine, where for years the U.S. has claimed to be an honest broker between Israel and the Palestinians, when in fact, everyone knows, it's self-proclaimed, the U.S. is on the side of the Israelis and against the aspirations of the Palestinians to have their legal rights under international law enforced and uh, to regain their political uh, sovereignty. Uh, 
and yet they claim to be a mediator. So the U.S. should not try to insert itself and claim to be a political mediator in Venezuela uh, either. For that, you'd need an outside party that has some credibility, maybe you know a figure like the Pope or uh, some outside uh, countries who could play that role. A couple of years ago, the Pope was involved in such an effort, but he received no backing. Uh, from the U.S. at the time, because they don't really want a political solution that leads to a truly open political field where all options are available, where perhaps, uh, you know, maybe a different uh, government, but one that is pro-poor and anti-U.S. Uh, could gain power. You know, if you had a genuinely open political process in, in Venezuela, a political outcome like that is certainly not inconceivable, but the U.S. would never tolerate that. So they have, they're, they're they're now trying to engineer a way uh, for the U.S. to regain uh, control, and to do that, uh, they'll be willing to use violence uh, as necessary, if necessary. Uh, and for that, Abrams is the perfect man for the job. Investigative journalist Alan Nairn will be back with him after break.